Well, thank you, Rachel, and uh, super excited to have everyone here. Um, I think these poll results, can everybody see these poll results? Yes. Okay, great. So I think these poll results align with what we believe also, that media can have a significant impact on your therapy. And 92% of respondents felt that that was the case. And that's really what we're going to talk about today is um, better media and better outcomes. And what is the relationship? Um, and I think in a lot of ways we've evolved um, in cell and gene therapy. And now we realize the importance of media and the importance of controlling the media um, to drive your therapeutic uh, efficacy. Um, this is our panelists today. Uh, my name is David Sheehan. I'm the president and CEO of Nucleus Biologics, and we're a leader in custom media and reagents. And uh, we believe that uh, media is a critical part of your cell therapy ecosystem. And I'll let the other panelists introduce themselves. Roddy? Hi, I'm uh, Roddy O'Connor, a research assistant professor at the Center for Cellular Immunotherapies at UPenn. And uh, very interested in this webinar today because my focus is on uh, CAR T cell metabolism. Hi, my name is Alex Clare. I'm the head of cell therapy development at Biocentric, an emerging cell and gene therapy CDMO uh, out of Newark. And you know, we're excited to be working with Nucleus and the other partners here to talk about the advantages of custom media. And finally, hi everyone, <clears throat> David Smith, Director of Research and Development at Hitachi Chemical. Um, so a CDMO devoted to cell therapy and really challenged, I guess, in that manufacturing space to say, how do we manufacture these future therapies? We know how we do it now isn't really working particularly well. And so we've seen Tree to dive into some of the challenges we're facing and some of the solutions that we hope to bring. Yeah, great, thank you. And um, Maybe we'll get started and talk about what we're gonna to cover today. So uh, clearly our industry is in a rapid growth phase and we're um, not only um, going through this rapid growth, but uh, we're also in a period where there's a race to get these therapies into the market as quickly as possible. And so time to market and uh, the ability to, sh uh, to cut time out of your development cycle is absolutely critical. Um, media and reagents are a hidden source of variability. We know that. Um, whether you're talking about classical media and you're going to learn about today or proprietary media, uh, and pr by proprietary I mean media that is sold um, kind of as a black box. You buy it from a company and uh, it's designed for a specific cell type, but you don't necessarily know what's the constituent components. And so both of those are a source of variability. Um, individual components in your, in your media can have a profound effect on your therapeutic efficacy. We're going to demonstrate today just some very uh, simple examples um, that both uh, prove the, the ingredients in your media can have an uh, effect in terms of tumor killing capability um, and in terms of efficacy. And up until now, there really haven't been any great choices. Custom media um, is extremely difficult uh, to uh, cut to create, and it's a long lead time, and, and in many cases, cost prohibitive. And really, what we believe is that um, as a scientist, um, you need to control your media. When you control your media, you have knowledge of the ingredients, you have the ability to troubleshoot results, um, you get your own, you can choose second source options. The media can become part of your company intellectual property, and that can not only impact your therapy, but improve your um, ROI as, as, a, as a corporate entity. And finally, it's maybe a question that we'll loop back to at the end of this webinar is, if media can impact your therapy, can it be a competitive advantage? Um, can it be more than just what you're growing your cells in when they're outside the body? And our, our view is the answer is yes. So if we look at this industry, we're at this cusp of the uh, very rapid uh, market growth. And um, 
The panel on the upper left is basically the growth in terms of billions of dollars in the cell and gene therapy market. And we're at this point right now where the market's growing at an 80 to 90% clip. And so, you know, that creates an underlying tension and, and, uh, and pressure in the industry. But the system's imperfect because if you look at the lower right panel, $28 billion a year is lost on irreproducible uh, research. And this is from PLOS Biology in, in June of 2015. But what's most relevant about that is 36% of the time, it was reagents and reference materials that were the source of the lack of reproducibility. Again, I'll say it again, 36% of the time, reagents and reference materials. So we've got this rapidly growing market and then we've got this imperfect research model. And now we're taking that into manufacturing. And you know, another data point is that an estimated 10% of cell therapy manufacturing fails. Um, and you know, those failures um, many times are not just that you're under uh, the therapeutic dose, but it's uh, problems with uh, reagents or the manufacturing process. And the economics of failure are really pretty profound for a therapy company. And so there's many sources of this variability. And what I'd love to do is have David step you through some of those sources of variability that lead to these problems. Sure, thanks Dave. And yeah, as Dave pretty much set up perfectly there, reproducibility, control, variability, all things that we really tackle with and talk a lot about actually. I think anyone that's been to any in-person conference last year, any virtual conference this year, would have heard a lot of the sort of, we need a better workforce, we need to look at automating to increase our reproducibility. Technology is a great solution, how do we work on that? logistics of getting products to each other, uh, a focus on quality for all of this. And now as products are starting to go sort of more towards the commercial avenue, where does scalability come in? But I think there's still a number of features that have such a profound effect on manufacturing that still haven't really come to the surface. We still don't talk about it. And for me, you know, raw materials is one that really sticks out there. I think David mentioned that the failure rates the number of sort of deviations we have every single time because of the variability into our process. And yet we go down sort of root cause analysis and frequently we point to a failure of technology, a failure of the workforce, but don't necessarily understand why that failure exists. Um, and I think if we just sort of dive into raw materials um, and look at how much do we really understand about our raw materials, and there's a number of buckets we put into we're all aware and we know, especially in this industry, the variability that we get um, from our cells, that initial input. Um, you're here, obviously, that the groups like Hemacare, Be The Match, trying to understand how they can provide a more consistent starting product. And that really variability starts there. But it has a profound effect thereafter. The consumables that we use, there's variability within those, whether they're sort of other reagents, beads, single source in the supply chain is still so fragile in our industry in such a stressful area in order to try and operate and produce a therapy. Cost is something that maybe isn't too um, much of a factor early on, but really starts hitting the point. And then buyer burden in particulates, what does that even mean? Particulates we could spend an entire webinar on. They're all things that add variability um, that we really don't have a good handle on. Media is another one that for me is maybe even more profound than these we're looking at single source we've seen issues in the supply chain in the last 12 months even prior to covid where we can't get our hands on a, a single source supplier suddenly especially this is a market looking to go commercial looking to scale up to really get bulk volumes and our supply chain isn't set up for that our manufacturers aren't necessarily set up for that What's the stability look like for these things? Another big issue, um, especially is through the logistics. Are they maintaining temperature? Are we recording temperature that our media is being held at? Lot to lot variability, and we'll come on to this one. Do we understand the variability? Is there something we should be measuring in there as we go commercial? Do we really understand that? And then some of these other things that really just fall off the radar. 
how do you troubleshoot media if the media has gone wrong? Can you go to some of these providers and change your media? Can you add a bit more glucose if you need it? It's a proprietary formula that you don't even know what's in it sort of thing. Where does the traceability come from? If you're buying from some of these large um, distributors that maybe have warehouses elsewhere that's stuck on a shelf at some room temperature maybe, maybe cold. There's a lot of factors in here that we truly need to understand. So I think one of the, the prominent questions that we asked at the, the start, do you believe that media can impact your therapy outcomes? It was great to see that of sort of the nearly 100 participants we've got in here that the majority are saying, yes, I think I do. But then I think the follow-up question, you know, there's this sort of cell culture ecosystem you control in that. You think media can have a, a big outcome on your therapy, but how much do you understand? How much are you controlling your media, therefore? Are you buying off-the-shelf media and throwing it over to the large companies out there and saying, you know, we're just going to use it. We know it's important, but we have no way of controlling it. And then should we have? control it do we understand that variability is there variability in your media is there lots of lot variability as we start to look to go commercial and i'm going to keep on coming back to it we need to understand that believing what's on a c of a isn't necessarily good enough and so this is a list of just you know understanding a few of the factors the prominent features that are in your media that make it up you know water is a large part of it there's so many different ways of water that could have a profound effect not even mentioning the amount of glucose or something all the different proteins cytokines growth factors there's a lot that goes into the media there's a lot of variability between each of these components and even where the components come from themselves so now you're looking at you may understand that your media manufacturer has a great quality system but where are they buying the components from what's the quality system that goes back go all the way through your supply chain to understand that that's a huge undertaking. So right now we go, oh, we're going to trust what comes on the C of A. And I think we'll see as we go on to the next slide um, if that's something we should be doing. So you know, using actually the Rebel device from 908 Devices, um, an off-the-shelf, easy-to-use device, we took five different vendors of DMEM, the easiest basal medias that you can get. 14 out of the 24 components were different than the specification. I'm going to repeat that because everyone believes the C of A. 14 out of the 24 components were different to the C of A, and no two of these vendors are the same. So does it matter where you get your DMEM from? I think it does. Right? Does it matter which lot you're using? It probably does. You can pick out any of those individual media components and see the variation that some of them have between vendors. You know, going from zero up to sort of a normalized value of 2.5 on some of those. Does that have an effect? You know, maybe we're barking up the wrong tree and it doesn't have effect, but I think there's something in there that says, you know, the variation exists. Maybe we should understand if that is having an effect on our product. Uh, I think with that, I'm going to hand over to Roddy actually to go a bit more into the science and understanding of how important these internal factors are. Thank you very much, David. Thanks. Um... Yeah, so for us, you know, uh, very interested in, I suppose we, we feel it's very um, underappreciated how the properties of the medium can impact the therapeutic potential for, you know, cell-based therapies. And of course, we're very interested in T-cell-based immunotherapies. Um, and, and things like, you know, our collaboration with Nucleus and this webinar, it really highlights a renewed interest in how, you know, the, the media formulations can impact uh, therapeutic effectiveness and efficacy. So uh, we're going to discuss some specific examples here. And the first is from, it's really seminal work from Roger Geiger's lab. And this was a, a cell paper showing how really subtle variations in uh, one amino acid, so the concentration of a single amino acid, L-arginine, that was adjusted in the media formulation. And they looked at how this influenced outcome or the impact in a preclinical model of uh, melanoma of uh, T cells that they, they did as we do in the clinic that were expanded ex vivo over a number of days. So, you know, for this experiment, they established these melanoma xenografts um, in their mice models. And at the same time, they're culturing tumor reactive T cells in a conventional media 
are immediate, which, like I say, it's a subtle adjustment. They've just increased the availability of L-arginine. And then once the tumors are established, they're going to infuse the, the you know, different groups of T cells grown in the varying medium conditions. So we can follow tumor growth uh, on this graph here on the x-axis over the days, so the days elapsed in the experiment. And on the y-axis, we're really looking at an index of um, you know, tumor burden. So we can see in the gray line with really no T cell treatment at all, there's an exponential growth of tumors, which would be expected. And then um, in the group that were infused with T cells that were expanded with conventional media, the T cells, you know, they have a remarkable anti-tumor function in the melanoma preclinical model. You can see that there is partial control of tumor burden where the tumors come down in size, but by day 25, there's kind of a relapse. So once again, the tumors kind of escape and they uh, emerge once again and grow exponentially. What's really interesting is that the group that received the higher arginine during the ex vivo expansion phase, that uh, the T cells really outperformed any other group. So they were superior anti-tumor function. Um, we can see that the, you know, the tumors are, you know, reach minuscule levels by day 20, and this persists over a long time. Um, so the performance of the cells is a lot uh, better than any of the other groups. So a subtle variation in the media component uh, had a dramatic impact on outcome in this model. So we're going to discuss another, um, a little closer to home, so from a, a recent paper we published in collaboration with Nucleus. And here we were interested in, once again, it's just a subtle change in the media formulation. We've replaced uh, the protein source, so human serum, which may become declining in years to come, with uh, physiologics, this alternative um, from Nucleus Biologics. And in a similar kind of preclinical model, we're looking at a model of uh, neuroblastoma where there's established, we established xenografts uh, in these uh, immunocompromised mice and the tumors grow over a number of days. And we prepared CAR T cells. So it's a CAR T cell this, uh, this time, redirected against a specific antigen found in neuroblastoma, the GD2 antigen. And, and the CAR T are expanded ex vivo, either in media, uh, conditioned with human serum or physiologics. And following infusion into the xenografts, we can see that the, the mice that were, or the, the T cells carts that were cultured with the physiologics at varying doses, even uh, you know, when, when the doses were lowered to really challenging levels to 0.75, that the, the tumor size was significantly reduced even at low doses, hinting at a, a, an increase in potency, not just a general outcome, but actually potency effect of changing um, one variable in the media formulation. So, so, you know, tremendous uh, and immediate translational kind of relevance from just a simple uh, adjustment. And, and we are going to talk as well about, we can't kind of talk about the metabolism issues without mentioning Erica Pierce's work. She led the charge on a lot of how metabolic reprogramming influences T cell fate and anti-tumor function. So once again, returning to a xenograft model of melanoma um, and, and she um, introduced the concept of uh, glucose restriction. So, so with her ex vivo phase of expanding, once again, tumor reactive T cells, uh, ex vivo, that with transient glucose restriction. So here it is, it's intermittent fasting for T cells. It's finally made it um, to a cell culture model. Uh, but it really had a remarkable effect whereby if we look at the, the preclinical model of melanoma and the tumor size, that all the controls are there again, where we see exponential growth if there's you know, non-reactive T cells present or infused. And, and the T cells where there's you know, transient glucose restriction. And of course, it's more than just a general caloric restriction because glucose has a very uh, kind of indirect and direct roles in T cell effector function, that there's a dramatic outcome. Once again, from changing uh, a simple parameter or variable in the media, the glucose levels that the, the T cells are exposed to during this kind of conditioning phase, which is highly relevant to clinical applications and all cell-based therapies. So uh, I'm gonna uh, kind of hand the, the baton to Alex now, and he's gonna continue our uh, webinar here. Thank you, Roddy. So as he was able to lay out, uh, your media is gonna have a substantial effect, not only on your manufacturing success rate, but on your therapeutic success rate as well. And 
when you're making a decision on such a critical part of your therapeutic ecosystem, you're really stuck between these two choices. You can go with a proprietary off the shelf media choice, or you can go down the path of custom media development. And I think largely the choice right now is people go toward off the shelf media where you're engaging with typically a, a sole source supplier who owns the formulation and who you need to trust is going to consistently and reliably produce and have available that media for you. But on the flip side of that, you are getting a readily available form media formulation that you can purchase off the shelf and have available for you early on in your clinical development. Then on the other side of that, you have your custom media where you can really define exactly what's in that formulation, know every ingredient, and try and maximize some of those benefits that Roddy was pointing to with transient glucose restriction or the potential for certain amino acids to increase therapeutic potency. However, there are current, the current avenues for generating that custom media aren't conducive to the regenerative medicine industry where a lot of the therapy developers are fairly small, are really pushing a lead candidate through clinical trials in an accelerated timeline where you can't work with a large media manufacturer and their six month lead time in order to, uh, er, and still meet your clinical, uh, clinical timelines. And then if you start to see some uh, efficacy issues during your development, it's very difficult to iterate with that supplier and say, I want to make small point changes on this formulation and still keep that su supply available and ready for your clinical trials. And so we see this happening in your clinical environment, right? You don't make these choices in a vacuum as much as we'd all like to be able to focus purely on the science of it. You have to decide when you're uh, betting on a certain media formulation and what the environment is uh, that's that you're going to make it within. And we've kind of broken it down into these four major buckets that you might be looking at deciding on a uh, on certain process changes. So you know, early process development where you're defining the therapy and uh, you're really focused on generating the therapeutic product and having and having a good understanding of your method of action. Or then you move on to pre IND where you're preparing for GMP manufacturing and human trials, right? And then you're moving on to early phase where you're focused on characterizing the drug product, the dose and potency of that therapy. And finally, you have your uh, late phase product where you're optimizing the manufacturing process and getting ready for commercial manufacturing. And when you look at the, uh, when you look at the comparability concerns with each of those, fa each of those phases, people focus in on the pre-IND phase to make these uh, major media considerations. So you have a 10 to 13 month period where you're developing your GMP ready manufacturing process. And the regulatory bodies are expecting some changes to the cell journey or some higher level comparability shifts between what you were doing in the uh, discovery process development phase and moving into uh, your early phase clinical trials where now you've filed your IND and your manufacturing process is a little bit more constricted. But as we talked about before, you're trying to hit these clinical timelines and you're really time constricted to make that choice. And you might be focused more on the speed of getting these process development changes made, which is really going to drive you toward the fastest option as long as it provides a reasonable level of efficacy. And so if we, if we expect people to be able to move toward custom media or have a better control and ownership over their culture media formulation, there needs to be a solution to that six plus month lead time on custom media formulation. 
And so to summarize what uh, all of our participants have been talking about today, we are in a rapidly growing industry and the time to market is key for all these different therapeutic modalities because we're all racing to develop hugely, uh, hugely efficacious therapies in modalities that haven't been available previously. And we're seeing a lot of variability, you know, and we're keying in on it a little bit more as we start to understand the method of action a little bit better, but we're still facing a lot of variability and media and reagents are an unexpected source of, of that variability uh, when we're using this kind of standard proprietary media that we're seeing coming off the shelf in the industry right now. And there's such a high impact from each individual component within that media. You know, we need to be able to exert a higher level of control with, uh, on each of those different components. And until now, there hasn't been a great option that would allow you to both keep with that uh, short time to market that a lot of the therapy developers are dealing with and uh, also address some of these smaller individual component variations that you want to control within your media. And as I'm sure a lot of you scientists want to do is create your, is own the knowledge of the ingredients, own the IP, be able to troubleshoot and uh, have a more sustainable reagent and manufacturing process in the long term so you can control the impact to your therapy over the lifetime of this product. So if you are not customizing your media, you may start to lose a competitive advantage in your therapeutic area as some competitors start to take advantage of these new, uh, new developments in this space. Thanks, Alex. Um, and thanks to David and Roddy too. Um, really wanted to, um, you know, make sure we understand this is a, a broad group here covering everything from the development through and the research all the way through to the manufacturing side. So you're getting um, insights from people that are close to both ends of the spectrum from the pure process development all the way through to manufacturing. And um, what I would love to do now is open it up to uh, Q&A and I'll let Rachel take over at this point. Yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, please do type any questions you may have in the Q&A box here. We're happy to answer them. Um, anything you want our fantastic panelists to comment on, um, please feel free to type that in as well. Um, don't have any at the moment. We do have a couple notes to us uh, panelists saying, uh, just validating how important custom media is and, and thanks for um, kind of driving this home. But um, one question we just got what kind of added cost is involved with custom versus off the shelf media? Yeah, maybe I'll take that. I think um, actually uh, custom media uh, is probably, if you get into larger lot sizes is going to be less expensive. And the reason why is because you're only paying for what you're putting in there that is unique to your ecosystem. And so um, a lot of custom media manufacturing is based on lot sizes. And if you get into larger lot sizes, um, the cost per, per liter is less for custom media than it is for um, a lot of the proprietary off the shelf medias. Great, next question is, how long is the wait time to get a tumor specific media to use in cell culture? Um, take that one again, Dave. Yeah, I guess I'll take that one again. I think uh, there's, uh, if it's pure formulation development, which we do a lot of formulation services work, um, it's typically around um, three months to develop a formula for a specific cell type. Um, in terms of the manufacturing of the actual uh, media, um, you know, our lead time is 12 weeks um, and um, we've done it um, as in as short as six weeks 
Um, and so it really depends on what your requirements are, but that gives you an idea of the time frame that we're talking about. Um, so if you're starting with a media right now, there's, it's a lot easier to, to uh, create a, an improved formulation or a Xeno-free formulation if you need it. Great. Uh, I can add, um, I can add something there. We, you know, we used to have reps uh, that stopped by the lab and in passing, they'd always mention, oh yeah, we can do a custom media. And then, you know, when they go back and you do a few back and forth emails, there'd be, you know, it'd be like buying a house kind of the, the cost and they want, you know, there's leaders and leaders you have to buy and the time frame is just, it, it's untenable. So th there's definitely, you know, highlighting the work done, you know, by you guys, Dave, it's just fantastic for, for the opportunity to make customized media in a short time. Yeah, I think that was the idea behind NB Lux was really to create a tool that put the control of the media back in the hands of the scientists and be totally transparent about cost and lead time. So you can go onto that portal, you can configure exactly what you need, whether it's the testing, the packaging, or the individual component concentrations, and you'll get a quote uh, right then that you can place an order against. And so the idea is, we don't, we, we know media is important. We can take the mystery out of the media um, and it has to stop being secretive because if we want to advance the science, we all need to work together um, to put these tools into the hands of the people that are developing these therapies. Great. We have some great questions coming in. I'll continue to read through them. Um, do you think custom media formulations are more realistic for allotherapies that are HD derived rather than auto patient derived due to heterogen heterogeneity? Sorry, guys. <laughs> heterogeneity. Yeah, that's that's an excellent question, Cody. And um, I think from the preclinical work, you, you, there should be a, a broad impact to all. So so we can't overlook it for anything. So so it should have an impact, and it should be broadly applied to you know autologous and allogeneic. I think I don't add that we haven't done enough work yet to even sort of really even touch the surface on that. I think, you know, we know that there's heterogeneity within sort of, I guess, more within the auto patient derived, but, you know, should we be doing custom media based on your product? So is a CAR T media very different from um, an NK media very different from really get into the depths and understanding what each of these cells need, which amino acids are the, ones that's really driving it, that's gonna give you the quality, the efficacy, the potency, the cell number of growth and things. And I think for me, there isn't enough research yet out there to say, I think, you know, custom media, I think jumps out that it makes sense to go down allo because you suddenly need a lot more media potentially. But I think even that I would start arguing, a lot of the allotherapies that are in clinical trials right now aren't that different in size to autologous. You're still looking at single digit liters, maybe just get into double digits, right? You're not looking at hundreds of liters that the biologics world is in where it really starts playing out. And I think that for me has always been one of the sort of hurdles to overcome is that generally it's a, a low number and maybe without taking over Rachel's job here, I see in one for David to answer, there's a question there that says, what would be the minimum order for the customized media? I think that's an important one to dive into. Yeah, actually on NB Lux, you can order um, two liters. So two liters uh, of custom liquid media, and you can also order powder of uh, any size or in any amount. So there is, the idea is to make this really easy. You don't need a lot of media early, early on. Roddy talked about um, being told that you had to have these massive minimums. And I, I think it's about what's the mindset. The mindset is um, industry is here to support the science. And if we really look at it through that lens and everybody embodies that in their product offering and their pricing strategy, then we're gonna move this this science faster, we're gonna get these therapies out there faster. And that's really the, the philosophy, philosophy that Nucleus has, is how do we make it easier for the scientists to iterate quickly, to get to an optimized outcome. And I think one thing that kind of ties a lot of this together is 
every single therapy provider has a slightly different ecosystem. They might be using a different bioreactor. They might be using a different cell. Um, they might be um, trying different to get different qu critical quality attributes. All of those have an impact around your media. Yeah, that's great. And uh, Deanne is asking if we have any case studies we can discuss. And I know here at Nucleus, we're working on a few, um, but I don't know if any of the other panelists know of any that they could share. All right, then I'll say hang tight and we'll get you some case studies shortly. Case studies in terms um, of, um, maybe, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing that because my screen is the one that's sharing. What are the case studies? Just asking if there are any case studies that we can discuss. Well, maybe Roddy, you can talk, you've placed an order on MB Lux. Maybe talk a little bit about your experience. What was it that um, you were interested in studying and why did you use that tool? Yeah, so for us, um, we do a lot of, for the metabolic reprogramming studies, we do a lot of, you know, carbon tracing and uh, isotopically labeled amino acids. So we gave the example of the arginine. And, and, you know, for those kind of studies, you have to kind of supplement an arginine free media with, you know, an isotopically labeled or a carbon 13 labeled arginine as a tracer. So you can, you know, trace the contribution into central metabolic pathways. And, and you, tr you know, trying to get things like an arginine free media or for other amino acids, if you're interested in, so we presented recently at ASTCT on branch chain amino acids. So it's very challenging to, to, to you know, obtain these medias, they're expensive. So that was one thing that really, um, you know, was of interest to me to, to have a, a really efficient platform to, you know, look at kind of novel amino acids that we could adjust very simply uh, and, and would be, you know, made very efficiently and reliably for us. Um, the other was, you know, we work on the Seahorse platform a lot, and that's kind of um, a unique media in itself. So, and it can be quite expensive sometimes and maybe not readily available. So it'd be nice to, you know, once we, you know, understand the components of it, to be able to, you know, make it ourselves even and adjust it ourselves and tweak it to our own, you know, unique formulations or specifications. So that was why I think the platform is ideal for us, for our purposes. Thank you, Roddy. Uh, the next question is, is it important to patent a novel cell culture media? Yeah, only if you include us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think, I, 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 I think you'll find there's challenges, right, Dave? Because you can't control what other people put in the media, right? So if you, if you disclose what's in it and you found something great, it's hard to, isn't that right? That you can't control. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think what the industry has done in general is avoid patents and kept them as trade secrets. And by trade secrets, it means that uh, it's not publicly disclosed. Um, the challenge with medias um, that you patent is um, you um, will be forced to list not only the components, but the concentrations. And so, Maybe as a therapy provider and as part of your system, it might make sense to go and file a patent. As a media provider, um, unless you've found some novel compound, and I, I think it's one of the things that I want everyone to realize is, you know, you you buy these off-the-shelf proprietary medias from these companies, thinking there's something novel in it. It's really not that novel. It's a lot of times it's standard classical basal media that's been supplemented with something. So the, there's not mystery. We didn't create new amino acids that don't exist. We're using the same base building blocks. And so that's why it's important to have this transparency, to have this disclosure and get out of this paradigm of secrecy that's holding back our ability to get therapies into the market quickly. Absolutely. The next question is, how is this custom media different from Plas Plasmax or the Tardito Lab uh, or HPLM from Sabatini Lab? Yeah, so it's kind of, you know, similar theme, right? David Sabatini's work at MIT, um, you know, it's, it's really highlights that renewed interest in an optimal media formulation. 
So he uses uh, his kind of, uh, you know, physiologic levels of all amino acids, all metabolites like glucose in his media. So that's his media formulation. And, you know, very relevant to, you know, work in that area would be if you're doing, let's say, studies on intracellular signaling pathways, It'd be a lot more relevant to what's happening in the body if you have a media formulation that recapitulates, you know, the concentrations found in tissues or found in plasma. So his, um, you know, simulates or, you know, mimics what's found in physiologic environments. And that's very helpful for signaling studies instead of having overly saturating doses, which is what's present in media today. And, you know, that was designed just to support kind of proliferation or cell propagation, but it's very limited in terms of looking at, you know, outcome in, in, in cells. So, so it's that renewed interest. It highlights a similar theme. Yeah. And I think we're interested in opening up that media discussion from uh, to kind of beyond what it has been typically where you might choose uh, a couple basal medias and uh, supplement different concentrations in order to test what you might want your media formulation to be carried forward. And, you know, maybe you're going to base it on one of these predefined media. And now with some additional tools, you can actually tailor it a little bit more precisely and create a design space for your media as opposed to relying on these design space that have been pre-ordained for you. Thank you. Next question is, have you seen any quality or functional differences between human source growth factors like their recombinant substitutions and their rec recombinant substitutions like transparent, et cetera? Um, anybody want to take a stab at that? I'll nominate Roddy. <laughs> well, we ha yeah, we're, we haven't kind of actively studied that. The, the you know, recombinant um, growth factors are kind of readily available. Um, yeah, we're not, it's not per se our, our active interest, but it isn't, you know, it is, without saying that it is an interesting question because so many people just buy, you know, recombinant growth factors. So they should consider that. Yeah, and I think comes. No, go ahead, David. Go ahead, David. Sorry, I was going to say I think it comes a lot down to you know you're relying on what the media company is telling you, and so a lot of what we see from the manufacturing is, oh well, we've swapped out. We are now using instead of sort of a human source growth factor, we're going to use the recombinant substitute. Oh, and it's better. And it's going to be better in your product, but they don't have your product. They don't know what your product is. They don't know exactly what you're doing. And so without doing that test, you're not going to know. And I think it comes back to a lot of believing what the media companies are telling you versus really evaluating it. I think, you know, everyone on this call is probably taught to question absolutely everything. And yet it comes to media and we believe what's in front of us. And I think, you know, to, to Roddy's point, I don't know that enough work's been done to actually say if there's a difference. Um, and as I'm not aware of people necessarily doing that work and there could be other drivers I, mean, I think there's other drivers to recombinant maybe it is less variability maybe it is lower cost things like that that are drivers it isn't always about necessarily getting the the, the best product that's possibly out there because there are other drivers in our industry cost time speed those sorts of things but uh, i think it's an important question and a, a good one to ask yeah um, another quick question here is before the decision is made for the right formula, kind of like beer testing and tasting in the pub, could you make some different, uh, provide some different formulas in small quantities to make the decision for the right one? And I what think a great a, question. Yeah. <laughs> the pub. Always love a good, always love a good analogy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the answer is yes to that for sure. And, um, you know, again, speaking for Nucleus, um, we do a lot of formulation work um, in the cell and gene therapy space. So we have a library of, of compounds that we've developed or, or that we've tested on our own, um, independent of the contract work we do. Um, and what's novel about the way we do our formulation services work is you own all the IP, we don't own it. So um, I think that um, gives you the flexibility to know that one, your 
uh, formula is secure and uh, it's something that becomes part of your uh, therapy IP. Absolutely. And like you said about Unbelox, you know, there's lots as small as two liters, so you can order a variety and, and test yourself. Lots of great options. Um, next question is, in a slide shown today, the actual concentrations of amino acids were different than the specifications. How can customers control the media if manufacturers do not meet the specifications? That's a great question. Uh, again, I think there's a part of it of holding your manufacturers of your media to the highest standards. And I think that's throughout the industry. We're talking media today, but it's across absolutely everything. All of your consumables, the particulates in them, the supply chain of them. We as an industry need to hold companies like Nucleus Biologics to a much higher standard than we have today. We've always got away, we've always trusted, we've always believed them and we don't push back. We accept what we're given. I think there's a certain amount that the regulation hasn't pushed on this either, right? I think the regulators right now have given this industry a huge amount of flexibility in which to operate given the results that we're seeing from some of the products. And so I know from us as a manufacturer, when we're buying media in, we're trusting the C of A. The reason we trust the C of A is that we've gone and we've done a quality audit on the manufacturer and said what they see is on the C of A and we believe that and we trust that. Now, this data and as we become more powerful with data, we can really start to question that. And as you get further towards commercialization, the regulators are expecting you to do that, right? You can't trust the C of A as you get down commercialization, you're pulling from each lot. You take, you know, 100 bottles that you've ordered, you pull a bottle, you're going to measure what's in it. If it's not to specification and a specification that you've agreed upon with the manufacturer that's documented, you don't accept it. You send it back, you don't pay for it. Right? And you, you hold them to that standard. And I think that for me, we're starting to see that now. We're starting to see some of the more crucial elements some of the raw materials coming in that people are setting up supply agreements with specifications in and you know companies we mentioned 908 devices right they're very easy to use instruments where you can do a quick verification pass or fail accept decline right, and go down that route and i think you know we don't need to do it for clinical trials um, but the need is definitely growing and the regulators are starting to push down on this a bit more and it's all part of, and Alex mentioned, know your design space, know everything you can. We can now measure all of this scientific information, so let's utilize it. Uh, we actually have the power. We don't have to buy anything off the media companies, right? They need us to buy their media. Um, so we need to start sort of holding them to a much higher standard than we have um, to date. And, and maybe just to piggyback on that, one of the um, services we offer to customers is if they want, we will do a chemical fingerprint of the media once we make it. Um, we do have a 908 devices. It's a, a great product. It gives you a pretty accurate reading of all the amino acids and so, uh, soluble vitamins that are in there and the concentrations. And so you will know how it stacks up against the spec. And so that's one thing we're trying to do to, um, to, to David's point. We need to be driving the standard. We need to be proving to the consumer that this product is what we say it is. Absolutely. Uh, the next question is, how does Nucleus Biologics avoid media manufacturing delays, as you mentioned, frequently happens with larger media processors? Well, I think one thing that we um, try and do is control the entire supply chain. So we do our own uh, milling and blending in-house, um, and we're buying our raw materials directly from the manufacturers. Um, that's probably different from a lot of other, a lot of the big companies do that, but not many of the small companies do that. So by controlling the supply chain, knowing the provenance of the raw materials, um, it's really important. It gives us also the ability when we want to do uh, quick uh, iterations or uncommon combinations, we have that flexibility because we have all the raw materials in house. And so there's still, I want to make sure everybody understands our industries going through this incredible growth phase right now, global supply chains will tighten. Um, and if you're on the procurement side, you're seeing it right now, whether it's uh, bags, tubes, bioreactors, whatever it is, um, global supply chains will tighten. 
and you know, picking who you want to partner with um, will become very important to your ultimately to your success. And so, what we try and do is uh, form collaborative relationships with our customers and make sure that we have everything in place to support their needs. Great. Roddy, this is a question for you. Going back to your recently published paper comparing HSA and physiologics media, was the consumption of other standard media components, for example, amino acids, different between the cultures or were the changes solely due to the composition of the supplements? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, didn't have the Rebel 908 device on hand at that time, so um, we didn't actively look at that. Um, we are um, formulating in you even better media, and we're actively exploring it. So it's, it's one of those kind of stay tuned <laughs> questions, but we're certainly taking a more comprehensive look uh, at that question with the new technologies we have at hand now. So. Great. Uh, next question is, since all the CAR-T and Ks may be, have different metabolic needs, some CAR may not need specific nutrients than the other, how do you troubleshoot this issue or thoughts on this? Any timeline for this? I think this goes back to, you know, what we're talking about is figuring out what the design space for your cell, your particular therapy and your particular cell type is going to be. Um, I think what we want to move, potentially move away from as an industry is you know, relying on media manufacturers to provide all encompassing solutions for what are like pretty variant cell population, and especially what we're seeing with the definition within uh, T cell and NK cell populations, where depending on the uh, type of lymphocyte that you're trying to culture, you're going to have slight or major differences in that uh, metabolic need. So I think it's helping your, your industry partners or your uh, development partners understand what your needs are and use the solutions like, you know, rapidly customizable small batch media formulations uh, to augment the already in place media analysis you might be doing and moving past the uh, media analysis as just uh, assessment of certain basal medium or media with uh, protein supplements or some additional supplements. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, can you give some thoughts on using animal derived components such as FBS or BSA and CGT media versus pure chemically defined alternatives? That might be a how long have we got? <laughs> I can go extremely high level and you know not saying anything that we don't know around where are we going to source enough animal derived components as our entire industry goes commercial and we're going to get stuck. But on the back hand, what we see they work better. We we use chemically defined media from large suppliers and we add serum to it even though they say you don't need to add serum to it even they will add serum to it when they start putting out papers and posters and things like that right is that to date so far that's where we stand now there's always new things coming on the market and i'm sure nucleus can talk more to sort of where they stand on this issue but to what we've seen is that you know we've moved away from fbs given all the tight regulation around the supply chain of FBS. I mean, is that going to be the same for human serum in a, in a few months, years, time sort of thing? And we're going to go more chemically defined. I think if we really want to understand variability, well, we know there's huge variability in serum, right? We know it's a big issue. We know it's a, a can of worms if we start going down there. So people don't want to do it. I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a really tricky one that cells seem to have a better quality with it in to date. Um, and that's changing and evolving before David jumps in. Um, but I think, you know, we need to see a way that we can remove it. We need to find a way to remove it if we really want to have a better control over our manufacturing. Yeah, I agreed. And I think we're in a unique position because we started as a fetal bovine serum company. And 
Um, you know, we prided ourselves on good, great lot to lot consistency, but there was still variability. And I think, you know, most of the formulation work that we've had over the last year has been move, removing animal origin products from uh, medias um, and finding um, viable substitutes. And somebody had asked earlier, for sure, recombinant uh, growth factors are less potent than, um, you know, the human derived versions or the composition proteins. And I think part of that may be the recombinant manufacturing process. It also may be that there's more signaling molecules in those composition proteins. And so I think where the industry is going is towards um, recombinant proteins. And I don't see that, I see that trend accelerating, not slowing. And so, you know, to David's point, um, FBSs have been around for 40 or 50 years. It'll always have a place in, on the research side. It just won't have um, a large niche or a, a large position in cell and gene therapy because the regulators don't want to see it. Uh, and one last quick question. I know we're running up the top of the hour. Uh, can NB disclose XS, XF physiologics components? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I'll say it uh, across the board. You know, we're developing uh, a T cell media with Roddy right now. We will disclose the components. So if you want to um, reach out to us at um, any of the information on here and more than willing to get on a phone call and um, tell you what um, what is in uh, physiologics and, uh, and um, also kind of some of the other work that we're doing. Great. And uh, I know there are a couple of questions we didn't have time to get to. If, if you still have those, please contact us here at um, any of the emails you see here, um, or you've got some emails from us about this webinar. So you feel, feel free to respond to those emails. We'll definitely address each and every question um, personally there. Um, but I want to thank you all for your time and joining us today. I hope you got something out of it. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Okay. Bye now. Take care.